Macau attracts 35 million visitors each year who go to play at any of the 40 casinos the region has to offer. Macau's allure created the world's largest gaming hub, bringing in tens of billions of dollars a year, dwarfing what Las Vegas generates. A small territory on the southern coast of China, Macau was unclaimed by any government until 1513 when Portuguese explorers became the first Europeans to discover that part of the world. After some conflict, the Chinese inhabitants of the territory had agreed to let the Portuguese stay along the coast of the peninsula as long as they didn't build or settle permanently. As time went on, the Portuguese became important traders with Macau and their control of the territory steadily increased. By 1887, Portugal was given sovereignty over Macau by China, and by this point they had complete control over trade as well as a separate government from mainland China. Since Macau had its own government, gaming was not heavily regulated like it was in China. One of the most popular games at the time was Fantan. The game played similar to roulette, and the people of Macau gathered to play it in small huts called Fantan houses. The Portuguese government was not concerned with the gambling going on until the 1840s when merchants began leaving Macau to find opportunity in Hong Kong's rapidly growing economy. To counter Macau's shrinking economy, the government officially legalized gambling and began granting licenses to operate Fantan, requiring operators to pay a portion of the winnings to the government. Over 200 Fantan houses popped up over the decade and were able to support the small territory, while proving the potential for a massive gaming industry in Macau. After seeing this potential, Macau's government began issuing monopoly contracts for large-scale casinos. This monopoly system helped regulate the valuable yet fragile gaming industry so that gambling operators were trustworthy and responsible. If anyone could run games of chance in the rapidly growing industry, it would lead to crime and risk collapsing the gaming infrastructure and the economy. Hohang Company won the first Monopoly concession in 1930, allowing the company to operate all forms of approved casino games. Hohang started its business on the fifth floor of the popular Hotel Central in the heart of Macau Peninsula. Hohang was a pioneer in the gaming industry, being the first to implement complimentary offerings such as tickets to opera shows, free fruits, snacks, and cigarettes to casino patrons. In 1937, Macau's gaming industry had undergone an uplift when the Portuguese government passed a law allowing the operations of different games. Around the same time, the monopoly concession was passed to the Tai Hang Company, which took over Hotel Central and introduced the wildly successful game of Baccarat. Tai Hang steadily carried Macau's gaming industry and catered to a huge influx in population during World War II when the Chinese fled to Macau, which remained a neutral territory. Tai Hang led the industry for over 20 years until July 1961 when their concession expired. This was also the year the governor of Macau designated Macau as a permanent gaming region and started laying out plans to ensure the successful future of the industry, including lower tax rates and classifying gaming and tourism as major economic activities. Another part of this plan was to liberalize the operations of games of chance for public bidding instead of just issuing a concession to a selected company. Two companies joined the bidding, the old Tai Hang as well as the new STDM. STDM, founded by a man named Stanley Ho and a few of his colleagues, won the concession and would go on to completely transform Macau into the ultimate gambling destination. STDM's first project, Hotel Estoril, marked the transition from uninviting gambling dens to casino resorts focused around hospitality and creating a good experience for guests. Eight years later, the company opened their flagship casino, the Lisboa. The Lisboa brought bright lights to Macau and created the casino atmosphere we know today. It started with a 12-story hotel tower with 700 rooms, further turning Macau into a resort destination, not just a place to gamble. Its flashing, rainbow-colored lights made it a sight to see and set the stage for what Macau would soon turn into. STDM continued to open casinos throughout the 1900s and Stanley Ho and his colleagues reaped the benefits of a 40-year monopoly. Gaming revenues alone brought in $300 million to $2 billion each year from the 1960s to 2001, creating an incredible fortune for the Ho family. STDM went beyond casinos, however. It used its resources to develop Macau's urban infrastructure, financing things such as electricity, export facilities, as well as communication systems with Hong Kong. They also paid 50% of their revenue to the government. The dominance of STDM in Macau's gaming industry created a ripple effect that strengthened Macau physically and socially, not only boosting gaming and tourism, but its other sectors like manufacturing and trade. Macau returned to Chinese sovereignty in 1999, and the new chief executive had new plans for the gaming industry. A consulting company was hired to conduct studies on Macau's gaming industry, and in July 2000, the Macau Gaming Committee was formed to develop administrative regulations and policies related to gaming.
Despite the success, Macau was in a tricky spot because it grew so big so quickly, and the territory was completely reliant on one source of revenue, gambling. What if China's economy were to dip or STDM were to corrupt and ruin the entire industry? How would they be able to support increasing global tourism with their current infrastructure? These were all problems the government's new strategies were targeting. After the research was complete, Macau now had clear drivers to create policies. The Macau government now needed to implement a new system to allow for the full potential of their plan to be realized. Macau altered their monopoly concession system to now allow for multiple concessions as well as the acceptance of foreign companies. This was a huge opportunity not only for gaming companies around the world, but also for Macau, as this decision to liberalize the industry even further allowed it to be as big as it is today. Companies from around the world scrambled and collectively submitted over 21 proposals including bidders from Hong Kong, the United States, Malaysia, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Concessions were granted to SJM, a subsidiary of the still dominant STDM, Galaxy Entertainment from Hong Kong, and Wynn Resorts from the United States. A legal oversight in the agreements, however, allowed for these companies to transfer the powers and obligations of the concession to other companies via a subconcession. This basically duplicated the concessions, allowing more companies to operate under the original company's terms. Galaxy was the first company to grant a subconcession, partnering with Las Vegas Sands. SJM and Wynn followed, granting concessions to MGM and Melco Crown, respectively. In just four years, billions of dollars of foreign investment were poured into Macau, and the number of casinos doubled. These new casinos helped triple gaming revenues to $7 billion a year, still a small number compared to what was to come. In May 2004, Las Vegas Sands opened Sands Macau, the first ever gaming development by an American company in Asia. Galaxy and Wynn opened their first Macau casinos in the same year, and their subconcessions followed shortly after. Over the next 15 years, the number of casinos grew from around 10 to nearly 50, accelerating Macau's annual GDP from $7 billion to $55 billion. Population soared and tourism was booming, so much so that Las Vegas Sands began a project to combine the two islands of Cologne and Taipa with a man-made landmass which they named the Koh Tai Strip. The Koh Tai Strip, similar to the famous Vegas Strip, was soon filled with hotel casinos from all of the new entrants, including the largest casino in the world, the Venetian. Macau became completely connected by bridges across all parts of the region as well as tunnels into mainland China, allowing for even more Chinese to come spend time in Macau. The decadence was incredible and Macau became a symbol of prosperity. The properties you can find in Macau are a testament to this, like the $1.4 billion casino called the 13, which opened with a fleet of custom red Rolls Royce Phantoms and over 200 suites from 2,000 to 30,000 square feet. At the same time, China's economy was growing and millions of people who previously could not afford to visit Macau now had the income to do so. And since nearly all of Macau's 40 million annual visitors come from China and other Asian countries, Macau heavily relies on their economic success. The incomes of Macau residents also grew with the territory, increasing from a median monthly income of 585 USD in 2002 to $1,700 in 2014 and the gaming industry employs over 20% of their total workforce, so much so that the demand actually outgrew the supply of trained workers. The new gaming landscape has shifted over the years, but currently stands at Sands China leading with 24% market share and Galaxy at 21%. Melco, Wynn, and SJM all hover around 15%. These shares fluctuate often as companies open and close properties and have different responses to the ever-changing market. However, it's safe to say that they are all enjoying owning a prosperous Macau casino. Macau has come a long way from being a small trade colony and is now the leading player in the gaming industry. Gaming companies dream of owning a casino in Macau as the success never seems to end and the market continues to grow. Many don't even know the small territory exists, yet it has changed the gaming landscape and set new standards for the industry.